Okay, so welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast. Today I'm joined by um, a very good friend of mine and an ex-colleague of mine, Eddie Munley. So Eddie, thanks for coming on the podcast today, mate. No problem, mate. Happy to be here. Brilliant. Uh, we follow on from a really good podcast uh, with Stevie Pope that did last time around GAA and trends and, and tactical insights. Today we're going to flip it back to what they call soccer, but we know it's football and we're just going to talk loads of coaching shots. This is the first podcast I've done that's going to be unscripted, so I've got an opening question, but no better man than Eddie Munley, the creative guru himself, to come on and freestyle for 45 minutes. So, hope you're up for the challenge, Ed. Yeah, I'll give it a go, mate. Brilliant. Just before we crack on, um, if anybody is not a member listening, please head over to dlsportscience.com. We've got uh, great offers on our online certificate that we've revamped recently and it's been very, very popular an eight module learning resource that takes you across the whole MDT around sports performance and discount for members there as well. So have a little look at the, the range of services that, that are being promoted over there. Okay, Ed, I'm going to fly through some things that you've done in your career and ignore me if I miss a few things out, you can plug in the gaps. But um, obviously I met you at QPR um, where you worked for a number of years. Prior to yeah. that, you was at Tottenham and, and coached at Spurs in, in a whole different amount of roles. Prior to that, at Crown and Manor, which I think you'll talk about your experiences potentially there and how that shaped you maybe as a person and as a coach as well. You went on to do some college work at St. John's Wood. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, with the Kinetic Foundation. So I'll, yeah. I'll talk about that, yeah. The Kinetic, trying to get boys back into the pro game. Um, as well, you fitted in quite a lengthy time in South America, traveling around and, and yeah. learning a few things and stuff over there. You've also got your company that you set up called Just Ball, which works with like professional players and loads of different services, one to one and group sessions, and you're expanding again. And currently in FIFA, working for FIFA, there's some coach education based in Helsinki. Um, so quite an extensive uh, list of coaching experiences there, Ed. Do you want to just run through some experiences from start to bottom, from uh, bottom to top, and just give us some insight? Yeah, I'll do a quick whistle top store, I guess. Uh, whistle stop tour, I guess. Yeah. Um, so basically as a young player, um, was at Leighton Orient when I was young, uh, wasn't good enough to go past under 16s. Uh, so went to a, one of the first of its time, time, a college program, which was like a real academy of training full time, playing against other professional clubs and other colleges. That was my introduction to Crown and Manor Football Academy, uh, where I met some really inspirational people there, players and, and coaches. And then from there, went off to America on a, on a scholarship, soccer scholarship, as, as they call it. I was there for four and a half years, came back, played non-league and got into full-time coaching whilst I was playing non-league. But before that, uh, luckily enough, Richard Allen, who's been a really good mentor and a person I've really learned from, um, he was the head of recruitment at Tottenham at the time. And he had just finished at Crown and Manor. So he was the academy manager at Crown and Manor. So he, uh, when he was in at Spurs, he, he was kind enough to ask us to come down and have a look at sessions. And if coaching was maybe a passion of yours, you could get involved in development centers. So whilst I was going back and forth from America, I would pop in and I would learn and I just just got a bit of a first for coaching, really. So whilst I still was pursuing a, a not great lower league career, um, I was still coaching and yeah, just led on to obviously yeah, full time with with QPR after some part time bits with Spurs. I'm really lucky to go through working with the babies basically at Spurs to U13s at QPR, then U14s and U15s, and leading the phase, and then working in the professional development phase. Really lucky to see like one full cycle of players going from eights, nines, tens, all the way through to to all the all the different levels. So that was really valuable. Um, and then after, you know, I wanted to push myself. I was getting a little bit comfortable. Uh, I've learned so much from Chris Ramsey, excellent coach, especially them younger ages, really making sure that there's individual outcomes in trainings and things like that. But I felt like I was finishing his sentences sometimes and needed a new challenge. So I, I said, rather than going to another club, I'll just challenge myself. Went to South America for a year and just went around still struggling with my Spanish language, but I can get by now and um, speaking to coaches and just watching different sessions and, and learning. 
I uh, learned loads in Argentina. Really, really grateful for learning in Argentina at a club called Argentinos Juniors, where Ortega and Maradona came from. Um, especially a lot of that's influenced uh, some of the methodology at Just Ball. And then, then yeah, came home and it was COVID, you know, and, and, and players couldn't train. And a lot of the boys uh, we would have worked with back in the day, they're all maybe League One championship that they're playing, but only the Premier League was on at the time, you know. So uh, it was tough. So people wanted to train. So we trained, you know, you could train with people up to up to groups of six. So we worked and then more and more players wanted to train. Then they went back into their clubs and then they wanted feedback after games and then they wanted some extra. And randomly, a, a performance consultancy just was was ignited through the constraint of COVID, you know, uh, which which was pretty cool. And then, um, so I was doing that and still do that. Um, and that's really growing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the, uh, later on in the, in the podcast. And then also went and worked for the Kinetic Foundation, uh, which similar to what I had when I was 16, where it's players that's been released from clubs or players just like maybe not quite good enough yet to go into academies or been on trial and, and not quite made it. And full-time education programme and full-time training and like the history already spoke for itself. Like when I was there, when I went there, they had already had about 40 professional signings. Do you know what I mean? And then over the two years, we added another 20, um, which was great. And there's guys there that are playing, like Joe Ar- Aribo's playing in the Premier League for Southampton, Josh Marger's playing for Bordeaux in France. And there's just a list of players that are playing in every single level that's just come from a real good culture uh, at, at that place. And then... um then yeah, then just was really privileged to get an offer by FIFA to come on board and as part of the talent development scheme to try and help raise global competitiveness of football and really support those countries that are outside the top 25s of the FIFA world ranking. Uh, so based in Finland at the moment till the end of July. Um, and then in September, I'll be elsewhere, not sure yet. <laughs> but you, you don't mind living like that though you're happy going from from i wouldn't say job to job but you're very um you're very creative in how you do things and like it was a big risk that you took going to south america you came out of a secure full-time job as you mm-hmm. said you wanted to challenge yourself and when you come back actually covid reignited some work for you but you didn't know that you didn't know that at all yeah. so i mean no, what, was there that side of you that was thinking like what if i don't get back in the game or was you were confident that there's going to be a market there for you um I would say I guess I'm quite committed when it comes to wanting to be better all the time and I, I thought yeah I'd I'd still be able to find work you know when it comes to coaching at, at um at some level I, I just try and make sure that I don't stay still for three years so at QPR where I was there maybe seven years but it was always different roles I felt like I was always appropriately challenged do you know what I mean? So, um, and it was nice to see that group that I maybe had at U13s end up go to be pros. Do you know? It was great. So you are seeing a, even um, saw Murphy Cooper uh, training with us the other day and it was just great to see him. I haven't seen him in a little while, but I remember when he was yeah. 13 years old and now he's obviously played for you lot in the first team, yeah. which is, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, that, that was really really good to see and then i thought yeah now it's it's definitely time for something new because there's so many different ways so many different ways and and so many small things to learn um so yeah i thought definitely uh keep trying to develop keep trying to move forward um i'm not really concerned with with chasing loads of money or and i'm not concerned it's not really a passion of mine to want to work in first team football I always want to be a developer of young people and young players and help grow the game. So that's what I'm always going to be doing whilst pushing myself to to learn all the time. Yeah, it's inspirational because I'm probably someone that maybe my situation is a little bit different, but craves that little bit of security. So to step outside of a job with nothing else there, like to see someone do that, and I've got full confidence that you'll, whatever you do, you'll be a full success. But it's really inspirational to see. And I know you say your Spanish is touching up on it, but you helped me on a night out with a few messages back and forth. So I, <laughs> I, have, think, yeah. I think your Spanish is quite good. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there, mate. I'm getting there. <laughs> 
Ed, what so uh, you said? Oh, I was going to touch on it if it came up actually around the first team like thing. I've obviously done this for the last season, and it's come with like massive highs and massive lows within one season already. Is there a situation where you would step into the first team role, or are you really driven and set on development and progressing yourself in that area? Um, I think I would do that role of you know that transition coach that helps the U23s or U21s or U18s that are in the first team environment keep on developing, you know, because you, you, you got, you got performance and you got progression. And sometimes you can't cater for that in the whole, in, in the week cycle, you know, because yeah. the manager's obviously only focusing on that three points. So yeah, that managing that, you know, making sure that the players are getting enough of the training where they're really focusing on their development. And, you know, sometimes the boys go to the first team and train that, they're basically a mannequin because they're used for shape and things like that. So you're thinking, all right, how do we then get an extra 30 minutes here or there to, to work on your strengths and develop your weaknesses if we, if we need to, to play the game. So, so yeah. And then getting that real connection with making sure that, that the review of games and experiences is real individualized and, and it's really for them and supporting a network around them, which is basically what we're doing at Just Ball, you know, and, and the players are progressing. So, Yeah. Yeah, in, interesting because I came on for you for a webinar and they spoke about how do you manage those players from a physical perspective. But actually, like more importantly, how are they managed from a tactical and tactical and their job role? Like it, it doesn't get done enough and it, it's, it's impossible for a manager to do it. Do you think mm. we're missing a bit of a trick with support coaches having that lens on those spring players or those squad type players? I'd say most, most staffs, like teams, coaching teams, you would have an assistant that, you know, his job is to keep an eye on the young ones and 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 all that. But I wouldn't be able to comment to say whether I think, all right, it's done right or wrong or whether it's done enough. You know, that'll be done to their their environments uh, just through, I guess, maybe speaking to the, some some of the players we work with, like they feel they need extra. Yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah. I think I don't think that's out of turn for me to say that that's probably a common at top like top level across the world, I'd say for professionals. And obviously there wouldn't be a need for your services if, if that was being done at the club. So mm. potentially an area in, in the future that needs to be addressed. Ed, just something then, because you touched upon like a few little philosophy details. I just want to broadly ask you, like, what is coaching to you? How do you go about your coaching? Um, yeah, and how do you really get engrossed in that development pathway? And how do you summarise it and work, I guess, with players day to day? Yeah, I would say in a nutshell... Coaching for me is is maximizing and unleashing potential in individuals. Like that's it. Because I think even if you're looking from a team perspective, if you get if you get the bricks right to build your house, they're your individual bits and, and you're gonna have the whole, you know. So I would look at it definitely from a a micro to the macro perspective and I'd work on the individual needs first. That's just the way I the way I work. Yeah. Um so yeah, definitely maximizing and un unleashing potential in individuals. And I guess the way I've been educated or the way I've learned and little bits I've nicked from here and there is first and foremost, uh, developing a connection with the player. So really trying to understand them, really trying to, first of all, almost develop a connection outside of football. That's a little bit in common. So you're developing that trust and rapport. Yep. And then trying to understand them and finding out what their why is. So I would always ask a question, what 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 do you want to attempt to do if you knew that failure wasn't an option? You know? So you're thinking, all right, now what what's the real, that real North Star, that real dream goal that you're going to go for? And some of the boys will say, Oh yeah, I wanna I wanna be the best winger in England. You know what I mean? And we'll say, All right, well, you're 16 years old. If you're saying that, well, are you living every single day? to go towards those goals and what things are bringing you towards and what things are bringing you away. So understanding what they really want to achieve and then also supporting that is what are some of their motivators and influences and wanting to achieve that. So is there, I'm doing it for my family, you know? Um, yeah. I remember we done that with, there'd be the current second year pros, I believe, or third year pros at QPR. And one of the lads' staff is he he said, Oh, yeah, he's he's doing it for Cyprus. He wants to be one of the first players from from Cyprus to to really be established in the Premier League. And you're thinking, wow, if you're not if you're not up for it on a morning, yeah. and all of a sudden you're thinking, Oh, I've got to do it for the country. Yeah. <laughs> all yeah. of a sudden, you know. So because a lot of develop some development sometimes is doing things 
that you don't really want to do, you know, but you need to do them. Yeah. You know? So, um, so yeah, getting that understanding of, of the player and then obviously working out a clear goal of like what we want to achieve short, medium, long term and, and how we're going to get there. Um, and then setting those, setting those little goals. But yeah, that's, that's how I would, I guess, define what coaching is, maximising unleashing potential in individuals and then the first really understanding your player and then setting a, a plan in place and a plan based on individual needs. So we're going to really find out once we understand the player, then we see them and say, all right, what can you be world-class at? So every every person, and it's my strong belief, that every single person has something that they're great at, yeah. you know? And you got, I think it's like Gagne's model of talented and giftedness, you know, and it, it, that's a theory that would say that everyone on the planet has something. So if it's within the football sense, every player that we're working is with, they have something. So let's really maximise that. Let's let's make that as good as it can possibly be. So every single session we set up, so they are working on that for at least a certain period of time of the session. And then they're going to have to understand the game and understand the movements and their job role, fair enough. And then if there's anything in that job role that's going to restrict them from playing football at the top level, then we have to address it. But we don't address it and try and make it world-class, just make it good enough and make the other things world-class. So if the manager's looking and he's saying, all right, I've got this player that's 25 years old and he's got 300 games under his belt uh, and he does everything at this level. And I've got this 18-year-old boy who's just as good as him at that level. Why am I going to pick? Why am I not going to go with the one with 300 games? But if you've got this player that does something outstanding, I might, I might chuck him on for 20 minutes at the end. He might, you know what I mean? And all right, I'll put him on again. And then they go and earn their shirt. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely finding a real strength-based coaching program. It's interesting you say that, Ed, because like the, the limitations or the restrictions have to be at a level where someone can't use it against them. So if they don't pin the back post that well, if they're done well enough, that someone can't say, well, he doesn't get in the box when the ball's never, you know what I mean? So it's like exactly. making sure that it's there. But the super strength one's really important and probably something that people come away from because we're geared towards negativity all the time. Just like we always go through what can't they do? Yeah, but mm -hmm. what can what can they do? You know what I mean? And you never see that. You never hear them conversations that often, I don't think. Yeah, I think that's just a, that's a natural uh, survival response for humans, right? We're, we're programmed to, to see the negativity yeah. from a real life real survival response to make sure that we stay alive. You know, you got, you got to figure out like what's negative around here and all that. But really when that's like the deeper part of your brain, but the, the human brain's about being more analytical and, and, and problem solving well. And, and you can really then when we look at it like that and shut off that bit of the animal brain a little bit, start thinking more logically, then um, it's all about developing strengths. It's all about developing strengths and, and, and really trying to help people be brilliant. I see the brilliance in them and try and maximise it. Yeah, it's a very positive and, and like you say, logical approach to it. Just a couple of things there and what you said. So at the moment, just for you're working with small groups and one for one, like that connection arguably is a little bit easier than connecting with everybody in, in a group session if you're taking a team, right? How do you connect with the players that you don't naturally connect with or you don't naturally have that much in common with? Like, because in a group of 15, 16, you're probably going to gravitate towards 10, 12, they say at most. How do you work on those couple of players that you've struggled to tap into? Yeah. And this is something that I'm still working on. Um, but what I do at the moment, I have within group sessions, I always have three players that I want to give some real, real, real support to. And that might change like every week. I might just focus on three. And then if you're focusing on three, you're still getting the secondary and tertiary players. They're going to have to do things to get those outcomes, you know? So they're still working on things, but the real spotlight rather than the floodlight, the real spotlight goes on these players. Yeah. And then if I'm making sure that that rotates enough, then every player is getting a piece of the pie. Then already the players are all feeling a, an appropriate amount of love and support from, from the staff. And then also the same thing is with my conversations. I'm making sure that almost like you go on some coaching courses, they ask you to do relationship maps with people in your, in your, in your club and making sure like you're, you're understanding how close you are to certain members of staff, whether it's a red, amber or green, I'd do the same thing with players. So what do I need to do to make sure it's all amber or green for the, for the most of the time? And if it is amber, all right, I've got to spend a bit more time with the player and you just have to find one thing, yeah. one thing that connects you, you know, 
What yeah. teams you support? Food? Where you're from? Brothers, sisters, whatever. You know, find one thing because it's it's deeper than football. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, and then once we find that connection, then they'll they'll trust you so much more. You know, and you can get you can go on a journey with them. Uh, yeah. Definitely, but it's not. Yeah, it's not something that's uh, that's like so easy to connect with people that you just not naturally connect with. You know, yeah. when you have to get out of your comfort zone and make the effort. I guess. Yeah. Yeah, good, good answer, Ed. And then the other one was just around your session planning. So, like, when I used to see you and we used to work together, and I used to see your session plan, very, very different to how other people would, would plan and was a massive, I'd say, influencer when I stepped in and did a little bit of coaching as well. Do you want to speak around, because it get, comes down to the individual, I, I guess, as, as the forefront, how you sit down with a group of 16 players and what's going through your mind when you start to plan these sessions? Yeah, first and foremost, the who. So who yeah. who's who's in training? Because you can say, all right, on our tactical cycle, we're kind of playing out from the back. But if four of your back line are injured and you've just got a lot, a lot of the front line, you know, you've got to think about what um what you got. So the who, and then based on their needs, you're thinking about a plan. And then obviously you think that'll help you with the what. And yeah. then you've got to think about the when because you've got to think about load and when when in the week it is and, and all that. And then you really bed down, bed down properly the how. And I think in pictures. Yeah. So I'll just have three pictures and I literally draw like a little camera, picture one, and then I'll think about three pictures and then the key players that are going to be in that, All right? And then these are the game pictures. So I've got that. Then I look at the end of the practice with those game pictures. What is my end game or end practice or end phase going to look like? Yeah. And then from that, I then strip it back and go, okay, what is a development practice that can lead into that? that has some of those elements because if you've just got a game it's so random you might not be able to get enough repetition although you get the realism because it's a game it the repetition ain't there but then when you strip it back you might get slightly more reps slightly less realism you know yeah. but it's still more relevant if you're looking at the three r's realism repetition and uh and relevance so yeah strip it back and then within that okay so that's allows us for more reps and strip it back again and then you get in the real mechanics of the movements and you can go fine into the real details so i'd i'd plan in pictures then i'd plan in reverse yeah. with the players outcomes in 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 the forefront of my mind and, and and writing it down and then you'd also then think about all right within that if the players are doing quite well and then the 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 excelling at it what constraints can i put on to make sure that they're appropriately challenged and then the other way around, what constraints do I need to do to make sure that it's a little bit easier for them to make sure they're in that 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 sweet spot of, of learning zone, you know what I mean? Or the zone of proximal development, as the uh, scholars say. Verko Sanctuary, is it? The, the Chris site. Yeah. Sanctuary, I think, yeah. Um, Ed, one simple thing, and it's something that I like, I always remember, your, your initial picture was when you have the who, it's like, get a pick, put them in their position. Really mm -hmm. simple. So you can see if you're front heavy, if you've got even distribution, where on the pitch do you want to start putting these problems and these sessions in? I, I haven't seen loads of coaches do that, but it's a simple way of just starting your individual outcomes for sessions, right? Yeah, and I would say I talk to a lot of the coaches I work about this, like working the pitch geography. Yeah. You know, so I see sessions that look, if you're restrictive of space, that's one thing. But I see sessions where possessions go across the box. Yeah. You know, like when does that ever happen? Yeah. You know, so there's so much subconscious learning for the players that can just happen if you're working in the right spaces. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's the right, right. They play there. So, and you're working on this. So start the ball there. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And make sure the direction's right. And yeah. Re really interesting. Germany is just, uh, you're probably in the loop, but have just like released a new revamp of their development model and everything's around pitch geography, 2v2s mm -hmm. around midfield, around the center circle, you know, stuff we've been doing for. A, for a while but it's, it's common sense but people need to think about that don't they every every little bit counts yeah i think um it's there's so much out there now you know what i mean you can go and find a session on anything and you know? i think sometimes we need do need to strip it back and just think look there's two goals there's usually 22 players on the pitch there's one ball that's like you know and it's it's i've got to go towards the goal to put it in in the net and yeah. then I've got to come and protect my goal by either dropping off and protecting the goal or going to win, going to win it quickly, you know. Like, and it's um, because there is so much out there, and there's so many uh, different words for things these days, yeah. you know. Uh, 
what is it now it's called quantitative to superiority because you've got more numbers you've got an overload i've got more numbers than you <laughs> why do you need to call it quantitative superiority or now it's called qualitative superiority because i think this player can dominate you 1v1 so i'm going to give him the ball like our job as educators is to make the game sound more simple and help the players understand the game yeah, not yeah. not to make it more difficult you know and that's not saying that we don't be detailed but detailed in the right way to get into the players world we're working in and help them see it help them see it quickly easy you know yeah it comes back to that, that good connection as well edge you spoke on the sessions around uh like setting up scenarios that might have greater repetition of something you want to work on as opposed to being random and purely just the game talk to me a little bit about and then you spoke about your mechanics talk to me a little bit about the, the isolated practice type work and then the game-based approach and these, this sort of shifting continuum where do you sit on that um and how do you like shape sessions to maybe bias one approach over another or is there something that's always common for you mm, yeah i think it again it might come down to the time of the week and how you want to periodize your training but one principle i definitely have is to make sure that the way you set up the session, there, there's enough variation in it that the players ain't like, oh, all right, we're going to come in, we're going to do some isolated stuff, then we're going to add a bit of distraction, interference, add another player, add a passive defender, go into a 2v2 or a little get or a, or a possession, then a gang at the end. Like, like, all right, that might be one way, but then yeah. in other times it's got to be a little bit different. Once the players are obviously warm and ready, all right, we can start with a wave-based practice. We can start with a game and then strip it back, hole, pot, hole, whatever, we, whatever you want to do, but make sure that there's enough variation in the training so the players are like, they're engaged. You know, it's it, it's not the same thing mundane because the brain will switch off and then yeah. it won't be an optimal place to learn. Yeah. So definitely having that, that variety within it. And obviously that's also variety in space, shape, size of the football sometimes. And, you know, so they've got different problems to solve. Because if we want adaptable players, how in God's name can we do the same type of session all the time and expect the players to then go and be adaptable? Yeah. For me, it, it doesn't make sense. So I definitely make sure it's adaptable. And I think for me, it's not like, all right, we should be game-based and the game is the teacher. And it's not, all right, we should be so isolated. I think it's based on the players' needs, yeah. but they're going to need, like I say, different pieces of the pie and it's got to be varied for them, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy that people even sit in one or the other camp. I just think you've got these tools to utilise and depending on who you've got, you you apply the right tool. And even mm-hmm. if you go like whole part whole or you, you do something slightly different to a conventional session, how important though is the learning outcomes that are, we say, scaffolded, but, but are set, the picture and the scene is set early on for what you want to get to in the end game, the end problem solved. Like sometimes I think practices are put on without any thought process of how it knocks on to the next practice and so on. How of course. Yeah. yeah, massive. So if, um, say we're, we're working on creating in the final third and we want to speed up when this midfield line is broken or something like that. So you know that your centre-back or your number four is going to need maybe that bit of disguise to pass the ball in between the lines, you know? And if it's going to go maybe from the nine, you know the nine's going to need dropping in short, setting, spinning, or you know if it's going to go straight to the 10 or the eight, you know that they're going to have to have good position in between two players. They're going to have to be able to get their first touch to eliminate the player if possible. So you've got all them little things. And if you look at it, you have the preparation of that as well. So it's like, if we look just at the midfielder between the lines, just something so simple as a centre-back opening up, looking like he's passing to the fullback, the left fullback with his left foot and reversing it into a midfielder that's pulling off and then opening out with his left foot and taking his first touch across the cone, not even a defender yet. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? All right. So what what's the what's your position in relation to the cone? Do you start in front of the cone? Well, no, we want you standing behind the cone because that's the player. Do you know what I mean? By the time the ball gets to you, how does your body want to be positioned? What's the how soft or how hard or the weight of your first touch? What's the direction of the first touch? You know, three steps across the line of the the opponent and then you add the opponent passive and then the opponent they can only turn when the ball goes past the line of their shoulder so they're facing the ball ball goes past the line of the shoulder they can turn and defend then you're looking at all right can i use my arms yeah to to go and 
increase the distance between ball and player? Do I need to then make sure I'm really getting it on the outside foot of my left foot so it's further away from the opponent? Or does the opponent jump quick and you go left foot, right foot across? And then, you know, so all the little bits. And then that just builds up, builds up, builds up. So then as well, you get so much of it that the players can start doing it without thinking about it. And then in the session later on, when you're doing a real game, you don't have to stop it and be like, oh, stop, adjust your body here. And, does, you know, because otherwise you'd have to stop it all the time. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. And then also those little, what we might call brush your teeth practices that the players should be doing every day for their, their needs. It's like they're so sometimes so simple as well that the players, you can set them to just do that. You know what you've got to do. You five minutes over there, you're working yeah. on pulling off and eliminating with your first touch. You lot over there, and and then they can start training themselves a little bit, and you just go around and you you help make make it the appropriate difficulty for the players, you know. So uh, so yeah. we spoke a lot before on the podcast about like arrival activities, like if those players know those specific things they need to work on for the first ten minutes before the second start, particularly, they can crack on with that, and it's all done in different areas of the pitch, and it's not yeah. not a generic brushing your teeth. It's this is what you need to work on. Here's your detail. Um, yeah, yeah, it's for your teeth. Yeah, it's just the <laughs> Everyone different, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, massively, and I think that as well, when in, involving the player in, in their programme, so I spoke about, all right, what are your strengths, what areas you need to do to work on? And it's about the player and the coach sitting down and working on it collectively yeah. and collaborating to be like, all right, this is what we're going to work on. I think, remember like um, Shiloh Remy's year, Shiloh's doing well, we'll probably get back into the league now. Um when we had them, they they done all that. They are oh, what's my why and who are my idols and what players do I want to learn from. They done all that, and then they also actually presented to the staff and the players videos of themselves doing what they feel they do best yeah. and how they could work on it, and then other areas for development and what they're going to do to work on it. So they were really really conscious about what they need to get better at. And if there's that collaboration between coach and player, then it's really clear that they're understanding that every session is intentional. Yeah. And then the attention, the intention then brings the attention in training. So I know exactly what I'm doing. I know where to look, what, when, how, why, and all that. And, you know, they used to come in and they fill out their learning objectives for the day. Um, and they got their journals that after the training, they reflect in. And really that's about accountability for the coaches as well. Cause yeah. If I pick up the player's journal and I've done a session and they're meant to say what was in it for me and they don't feel that a part of the session didn't have outcomes for them, then it's either me that didn't do something right or we have to help educate the player into understanding that learning process and what was in it for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's what I was going to say because when you spoke about the spotlight of three players, in anything you do or more 90% of the practice you put on, there's always going to be an outcome for every player, but it's that player having an awareness of that. So if they've got that accountability and that ownership of their own development and what they need, in a sim- even if you put on a basic possession practice, there's going to be so much for every player within that. It's mm. them having that understanding. And it comes back to connection, doesn't it? You had a great connection with that group. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and you drove course. the standards high. Ed, just um, moving thing a little bit, because I'm kind of conscious of time. And also I want to make sure that we get a, a few topics um, out there. You're currently working in Finland, so you're doing, as you spoke about before, some coach support to try to increase the let's say, competitiveness around the globe. Not just Finland, you've been to South America, you've been in America. What's some like real differences that you've seen amongst the countries? And then also maybe some similarities that you've seen as well, where we can take stuff from other countries that maybe we don't traditionally. What have you seen from a national perspective or international perspective? Okay, so internationally, I would say uh, most... I'd say if not at least 90% of teams, coaches that I've spoke to and seen would say they play a brand of progressive possession-based football that press high out of possession. Most, most. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, at Kinetic, we we said, no, we don't do that. We play solution-based football with intensity, style, control and togetherness. So we get the players to actually look for solutions. You know, if they're pressing really high and the space is behind, we'll put it in there, we'll mix it, you know, because yeah. we wanted to teach the players a wide variety because we don't know where they're going to play, you know. Which is which is what you did to us in, in a pre-season game, I remember, when we were trying to press you high, you just spun it into the space where the centre-half was isolated. 
So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, because if yeah. yeah, the opposition want to give you a one v one close to their goal, well, we'll, we'll take it. You take know? it. Yeah. yeah. So um. So yeah, I think, but yeah, a lot would say, all right, this is our style, um, and then I would say a lot of the training. Things we can learn. I'll start with positives for first. Things we can learn in Argentina. I never saw a session that didn't have finishing in it for some reason. So there wasn't one session that at least fifteen to twenty minutes they didn't work inside the boxes, you know. And I think we can definitely learn from that. And I'm not saying they were definitely the best team at the World Cup. At the end of the day, they won the World Cup, didn't they? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously there's a lot more to it. Um, so that was interesting. Also, the games are won in both boxes. Other games are won and lost in both boxes. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they yeah, are. yeah, yeah. And when I look at practices in most parts of the world, I do see that it's a lot outside both boxes. You know, and it's you know practices are now heavily um, have the spotlight on build up play. You know, yeah. because I guess maybe as coaches, you know, we, we can control that with the positions and all right, we'll get we'll work the overload. And, you know, I've, I've, I do it and I've done it before. I'm feeling, oh, yeah, I feel really good now. You know what I mean? But then if you work on that and the players always have the perfect support, then what happens when the chaos comes, which it does in a game, because that's part of the game. And how can they get out of it without the support? Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, that's something to think about. And what I really liked and learned quite a bit in, in Argentina was like, they almost train some of their players the way goalkeeper coaches train goalies. So if you watch goalies, like obviously they're working the right area of the pitch, but also they always work in sort of sets of three. So they'll train and practice after they've done their basics, three key situations, you know, so they'll go, all right, low clap, save, um, reaction, save, then catch across and maybe counter. No, it's like bam, bam, bam. So you're thinking about that ability to really think about your next action and not switch yep. off after an action. There was always, and even with, so with the strikers, there was always a before, during and an after. So they'd go, they'd have a shot, bang. Then they'd go press a centre-back that's stepping out with the ball. Then they'll get another through ball and have another shot. You know, so when you see that within the training, you know, when they're working on the individual bits, you're thinking, yeah, there's there's definitely something in that. And it's, it's yep. something we've we've sort of brought into what we do at Just Ball. Um, and I think it really, the, the players kind of do say like, man, if you switch off in one of your sessions, you're done, you know, because they'll just get lost in it. Like they, they, it will break down, you know, or like, yeah. Um, so that that was quite good for that real mental alertness. And if you think about how many goals are scored from transition, I guess if you're a bit more you're alert, you're going to have a chance. Yeah. Um, and also that ability to adapt again. You know, so if I if I miss a shot and instantly my head goes down here, first of all, you're releasing cortisol when you go down here. It's a stress hormone, so you're not going to feel great, are you? So it will do that right away. Then you, you're out of the game and you're not in the moment, you know, and the manager does not care for the next five or six seconds if they're on a counterattack about your feelings. And yeah. even to the fans that pay the money to go and watch you, by the way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's about trying to help help that and also help people get over things quickly. Yeah, you know, everyone misses. Everyone has a mistake. Like it's about how quickly you can bounce back for things. And a footballer's career, just like everyone's, is is so non-linear, and you have so many speed bumps. So if within the training session you can have those things as well, you're thinking about developing uh, more deeply people's character. You know, so that's that's something we 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 try and look at. And then um, and then yeah, I'd say one thing I was really impressed with uh, one place was was sport in Lisbon on the intensity of 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 what they do um like a day before a game uh, they're under 15s and 16s like they want players that can run with the ball and dribble you know so i saw like just real intense 3v3s 2v2s half pitch like going at it going at it the day yeah. before a game and they were like yeah look once every so often we train them really hard the day before a game to then see what they're made of the next day that doesn't yeah. mean they do that all the time but um, I was really impressed with them and, and and how they they have such a clear identity. And I guess maybe that's why they're their only club to produce two Ballon d'Or winners, you know. But um, yeah. So um, Just going back to your, one of your first points then, do you think then we need to come away from here's our brand to you talk about adaptable players to that problem solve 
um, early on. Let's give these like kids more tools where we're not just playing this one style because you know the academies are guilty of it up and down the country where they have their style and they stick to it. Where we're going to tap into lots of different styles so that on the pitch they can problem solve and switch to different styles if needed. Yeah, yeah, I think you definitely have your principles that you stick okay. to, um, but I would say yeah, more of a more varied varied style might might help a well-rounded education for the players yeah you know? and yeah. more than anything look I, I i love keeping the football you know i love i love looking at brighton's deserby play and, and and things like that but we don't know what the game's going to look like in 10 years so if we're working with 12 year olds on that then maybe that's a problem because it might look different you know yeah. you might get like when you look at futsal the way they play 4-0 because in futsal you can't go back to the goalkeeper after one pass so yeah. That's imagine like the goalkeeper's pressed and you're full press and you've got to get out somehow. And if in the future you have, well, if even in today, if a team full presses you and you have a centre back that is completely dominating your your nine and you have an opposition midfield that is winning every single second ball, well, that maybe ain't the solution. So what are you going to do differently? You look at Hamburg, Hamburg last season when they were when they were playing out. Sometimes you, you had the 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 centre back going to get it off the goalkeeper, playing to the other centre back, then running into midfield, then the full back comes into the centre back position, and they look like they're playing four zero in futsal, and it, it's actually quite difficult to to mark. You got, I guess, you yeah. got to have some real um, real confidence and real trust from your chairman to play like that, because if there is a if you, if you do concede because it's new, they yeah. uh, there will be some fear and um, some some apprehension against that. But um, yeah, I think definitely the future is going to be more people adapting because as well you go you've got the analysts up in the stands now you got nearly most sunday league teams over here have vo you know <laughs> so uh and even even at kinetic would be like oh, let's get hold of their vo and have a look at what they look like <laughs> do you know what i mean so yeah. i think if if the op- opponent always knows like what you're going to do and they plan for that then how are you going to be able to switch and change and and, and, and adapt? So what, what will the future hold with that, you know? Yeah, v- very interesting. Also, not just the future game, but also different styles and different managers. Like when you prepare the under-12s, what level they're going to get to, who knows really? You're trying to get them as high as they can, but they could be playing for anyone. So for them to be successful, they need to be able to adapt to those different styles, I guess. Um, massively, massively. Just a couple of questions. I want to get into your, your just ball stuff in, in a little bit of detail and just let you explain that a little bit more. Um, so working with like different pros around the country and groups of players and, and to support that individual, like a couple of things really, like what the massive benefit from you and how do you find it working with smaller groups as opposed to working with that team and having that, I guess, that team cohesion and a collective drive? And also like what sort of services are you giving and, and how does it work on, on a, a day-to-day and week-to-week basis for the year? Yeah, so um, I start with, I guess, like from a personal standpoint, why yeah. I love it is because you'll be working with a striker from South End that play a certain way in a certain league yeah. and has to deal with certain problems. Then you might be working with one from Arsenal. You know, <laughs> and that's a completely different world. Yeah. And whether that's U23s, U18s or, or, or first team or whatever. And then, you know, so you, you're working with so many different types of players within the diff- with different types of the game. And then you might be working with a 16 year old left back or whatever, you know, so, and, and it's challenging then, all right, how can we really see what's the best benefit within training for your world, which is great for where you're at. And then, yeah, you might have some that, you know, they get one day off a week and they, they want to come and do something light and you have to make the decision whether that's the right thing or, or not. And having to work around that as well and adjust. And maybe that one player is also if someone else that didn't play yesterday and you're you're in a session together and how do you manage the two loads and all that. So that's really nice. And I feel that's a, a really, really good challenge, you know? Um, so that's great. And how we shape it, and I guess the, the model, it's, it's more not just doing sessions, Ross. Like it's not just sessions. It's more like mentoring. Yeah. You know? So... It's same, like I said, how I would see coaching is that it's really trying to understand understand the players and really trying to help working with them to maximise their, their potential. So that's not just all right. Yeah, we can design a good training session that's going to have good outcomes, 
based on, let's say, all right, we've looked at your last 50 chances on goal and we've noticed that 60% of them come from this zone with this type of pressure. So we're going to recreate those situations a lot. We've noticed 25% are in at the back post. So we're going to recreate this. We've noticed actually if you made this type of run, you could get in this position. So that's going to help. So we'll do that and we'll design a session around that. And we'd also show them them doing it. And then we'll also show the world's best doing it and compare. And they can reflect on that as well. So we've got an online platform we're developing with that, where the players can go online. There's some um, interactive learning for them as well. Um, but it's not just that. It's, all right, what's your body language like when you walk in the club? Are you the first one in? Are you going and do a prehab? Do you know every single member of staff in that club? And if it came down to a meeting, would they always be championing your name? You know, because you never know. You might have one day where it ain't gone right for you and you're a bit moody and you've rubbed someone up the wrong way. They've gone to another club, a member of staff. The other clubs say they want to buy you and they say, nah, he's a bad egg, you know? And at the end of the day, just as a human, you want to be a positive influence to the people around you. Yeah. So trying to help them see that and what it is now. And I guess some of the reason why we said, all right, we're going to pursue this is because in England, really difficult because players get too much too young. You know, we've got the Premier League money. So, you know, it's very difficult for players to really be in a position where they want to fight for things and want to yeah. earn things. And then you almost get that sort of entitled mentality. And then when things don't go your right way, you get that victim mentality. Yeah. So we sort of said, no, all right, well, we want to try and, and almost reignite that, that spirit of the game where it's all about old school values, working really hard, but with a new school mentality towards coaching and, and, and developing, you know, so that that's where we, we sort of, decided to really pursue it after a few of the players were asking. So it's uh, it, it's real mentorship, even making sure the players, you know, they're doing their their extras there. If if they're, well, meditating is a bit of a non-negotiable for the, that they have to. Do you know what I mean? We have other bits like, all right, a plus or a benefit is, it's, it's desirable if you go grounding and stuff like that. And we give players books to read and, and things and, and things to study and, we're, we're looking at as well some of the older players mentoring some of the younger players with a few bits because they've been there and they've, the younger players are probably going through some of the things that they've experienced firsthand a couple of years ago. So that's maybe sometimes more powerful. And yeah. then also looking at players that are falling out of the game, going into non-league, a bit older, that, all right, well, we get them on board with some coaching and, and try and help them with that assimilation to the to the real world. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... Not just right, yeah, come do a session and and we'll show you putting the ball in the top corner and take a picture on Instagram. We want to try and help help kids' lives. Yeah, mate, really, really good explanation. And you're doing some fantastic work with you and, and Kez, who, who's been there for a long time and you two are the, the, the founders, really. Anyone who listening who wants to have a look online, just ball is J U F and then ball. Um, just have a look. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, took, we just... took the T out to get a little bit street, but yeah, just ball performance. Oh. Well, you are street. You are you are street man. So don't forget that. That's the connection. Yeah, well. yeah. Stay close to the roots and all that. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, it's great stuff. But and, yeah, and just ball performance is. Um, and we've got, like I say, there's we're toying with the online learning platform, which uh, players are finding good value to. To be fair, so we're able to really, you know, we're going to work on blindside movements with a striker, or yeah, or cross it, or attacking from wide areas where that will come out. It's like, all right, we've got videos of that with explanations and annotations. They're like, go look at that, then come yeah. and train, and we can show you a video of you doing it. Then go look at that video again, and and see 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 what you got. And we could be like, look, you remember the video? Harland, he pulled off here when the ball's in this position. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Look at his change of speed, and so that that's a real tool because we went around and so like, no one really has a bank of of every single element of every single position broken down. Mm -hmm. you know so everything every position needs to do is there clip 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 clip, and loads of explanations and all that so it, it, it sort of worked as a good a good learning tool for the players rather than us always having to send individual ones to the players yeah no it's amazing and stuff you're doing is really good and i guess your holistic knowledge and understanding of everything and it comes to my last point because i know the listeners will, will be interested in it obviously it helps that helps the players Working with the MDC, Ed, so you've had experience in different clubs, working with like a, an MDC, a medical team, sports science team, analyst, mm. analyst, other coaches. 
Yeah. Talk to me in real terms because we've had some really good discussions in house and also outside of, of work. So sometimes the, um, the the debates that go on amongst the NBC and it's not always perfect because everyone wants slightly different outcomes. And mm. talk to me a little bit about real life and and how I guess you've navigated your way through that in your career. Yeah, I think I think um, I've maybe learned to do it a bit better as I've progressed, like everything. Uh, but I think. You have to have the conversations and you have to have obviously the trust to be able to have the difficult conversations, but out of the conflict comes cohesion. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So it's not like, all right, I'm going to just completely let him do what he wants to do because he says, all right, the, the sports scientists or S&C coach might say, all right, can we work in a really small area today because we need to get the X cells and D cells and all that like all right, cool, that's a guideline and support. But if the player really needs something else, then there's got to be some conversation there and I think that's where we got to a stage Ross where because as well you, you played the game as well and you understand it, mm. it 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 was quite easy to work together in that in that sense and then if there was something that needed to be done like a top up or something different or you would say right they need to get a, a bit more high speed running let's open the pitch out a little bit and it was there there's that flexibility but I think it's important that the trust is there between the members of staff and yeah. you sit down and you look at the players' needs and and you plan it together based on based around that. And part of those needs, yeah, is what do they need physically to support what they're doing yeah. to solve prob- real football problems on the pitch and stay injury free. Yeah, um, you put put it really well. I think like openness and people being like humble. Look, those conversations aren't attacking your work or your personal beliefs. Mm. Everyone just comes at a slightly different lens. I even think about certain players in the academy coming back from injury. And maybe have trained to say two times but for, as, as an example and as a coach then you're saying well they look really good in training you're happy with their rehab why can't they play some game time at the weekend and mm. the people will be like no have to do a four week of training that's our policy so those sort of conversations are only there in the interest of the player like and you're mm-hmm. just having those conversations on a daily basis so people are scared of conflict as you said conflict brings cohesion i think you put it really well yeah and i'd say that one as well. Sometimes you, if you're doing a Tuesday session and that player's just coming back from injury, let's say he's had a few days training and you're doing a red, you know, and he's doing loads of 2v2s, 1v1s and all that. Well, like if you're playing a game against a team that you're definitely going to dominate possession in and they might be in a low block, you're actually yeah. going to do a lot more work in that in that session. So it's about, all right, these are our policies or our guidelines, but let's look at it um, and, and let's discuss. 100% Ed, context is always key and, and all those good discussions. Ed, we're going to wrap up there, not because you've got to go, because I know me and you could talk for hours because I've got to do the school runs, so I'm the limiting factor. But just from here at um, Locker and Podcast, mate, I always learn when I talk to you. So thank you very much. First time we did Likewise, our mate. Yeah. I we navigated it quite well. Um, yeah, all the best for the summer, mate, and I hope the, the Just Ball stuff goes well. And uh, yeah, we'll chat, we'll chat soon. We'll catch up soon, mate. Thank you very much.